Hey everybody, it is Tuesday, <clears throat> November 1st. Hi everyone, I'll give a moment for people to join. It is Tuesday, it is one week before the midterms. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me tonight. We are gonna be doing a few interviews this week because it is one week until the midterm elections and there are a lot of things to talk about. Can you all hear me okay? I hope you can. Um, hi, I like when people call me Boo. Hey, Boo. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Any, <clears throat> anyway, um, we're going to be doing some interviews this week about the midterm elections. We're going to talk about different topics, inflation, abortion, gun violence, election, uh, election deniers, and democracy. And our first guest is Liz Smith. She's a Democratic strategist. She's worked on over 20 campaigns. She was the senior advisor to Pete Buttigieg's 2020 campaign. Her book called Any Given Tuesday about her time behind the scenes in politics is a New York Times bestseller. She's going to give us a scoop and uh, sort of the lay of the land, what's happening um, with all these uh, races that are extremely tight across the country. So let me see if I can find my friend Liz. I accepted her. She's really nice to do this and to spend a little bit of time um, talking about this. Hi, Liz. Hi, how are you? You look so pretty. Thank you. I, I, I got to say, I'm sort of nervous because you just were talking about my book, Any Given Tuesday, and I spent the entire pandemic writing a book, which meant that I avoided sort of Zoom culture and Instagram Live culture. So this is my first ever Instagram Live. So I'm thrilled to be doing it with you. All right. Well, I'm sure I'm sure you'll get the hang of it, Liz. <laughs> and it's pretty comfortable uh, being on on camera. We're getting strange questions already. If you all want me to turn the comments off, I will. If you, you want to ask a question, you can do it in uh, the question section of this Instagram. But Liz, I thought we could just review real quickly for people what's going on and do a basics kind of uh, midterms 101. Democrats currently have a 20, 220 to 212 majority in the House, 5150 in the Senate. What are the odds that they, you want me to move, turn them off? Okay, I'm gonna turn these comments off because they are a little, um, they're a little distracting and annoying and you can't see that pretty face of yours, Liz. But, um, you know, what are the chances that they are going to lose both chambers next week? Well, it looks very, very likely that we are going to lose the House. Um, and that's not unexpected. And that was the expected outcome from the beginning. There was a thought over the summer that maybe we'd only lose it by a margin. We'd only lose five seats or 10 seats, but now it's looking more like it's going to be 25 seats or, or more than that. And I don't know if you saw today, but a bunch of um, very democratic seats, you know, that Biden won by over 10 points were moved into the toss up category. And that does not bode well for Democrats, obviously in the house. Now there's slightly better news in the Senate. Um, you know, as Senate races are statewide. They're more likely to sort of um, withstand electoral waves. And in the key Senate races that we have, uh, one, you know, it's all in states that Biden won. That's the good news. The bad news is that we're talking about states like Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, and in some of those states, he only won by, you know, a point or two. Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, Pennsylvania, right. I'm just, and I'm just talking about the ones where we are, have to hold Democratic seats. But yes, and Pennsylvania is, is going to be um, another key race. New Hampshire is going to be extremely tight as well. There was a poll today that came out showing the Republican up by one point. Um, so I think we do have an even shot right now of holding the U.S. Senate. And if we do, it's because we nominated generally pretty strong candidates um, and we have strong incumbents and the Republicans did sort of go with, you know, this political island of misfit toys. Um, so that's the one bright spot I could see. Then on the state level, you know, governor's races are going to be a mixed bag and there is a shot that, you know, you, you will have a lot of election deniers elected as governor, secretaries of state, attorney general, state legislatures, but, um, that that wasn't part of your question, but it, it should be something on people's minds because state level officials are the ones who do dictate a lot of the election laws. 
Um, so why why having election deniers in those positions? This is kind of a Captain Obvious question. Why is that no bueno for democracy? Well, because it's governors, it's secretaries of state, it's attorney generals who who um, and state legislators who figure out how these states conduct their elections and how the votes are counted and whether the votes are counted. And I got to tell you, I was reading um, some of the New York Times today came out with a number of gubernatorial polls. And there were some sort of scary stats in there. Hold on. I had to print it out because um, I was reading this earlier. Is that so in Arizona right now, the um, the race is neck and neck between Carrie Lake, who's an you know, one of the more brazen, outspoken election deniers, and Katie Hobbs, who's currently the Secretary of State. And among all likely voters in Arizona, 19% um, say that they are, uh, they want to vote for a candidate who, who believes that Trump won the election in 2020. And in Nevada, it's 21% of likely voters who say that they prefer a candidate who believes Trump won the 2020 election. So you do have, you know, a significant one out of five people in these states who are saying, I actually want our next governor to be an election denier. I want our next attorney general to be an election denier. I want our secretary of state to be an election denier. And then that means that, you know, in states like Nevada and Arizona, that there's a good shot that we could end up with these people. And those are swing states. This is going to matter in 2024 if we have people who are election deniers in charge of, um, you know, carrying out our elections. And basically, they have the power to overturn sort of whatever the vote is in that state if they don't agree with it. Right. And they can they can say, you know what, why don't we stop counting the absentee ballots or why don't we close down these polling sites or why don't we get rid of no excuse absentee um, ballots? Why don't we get rid of early voting? There are so many different things. And obviously, state by state, it varies. Every state has different voting laws and different laws about you know who can affect what. Um, but, yeah, it, it, that should be very troubling. And, you know, for something so important. Um, you know, the future of our democracy. Unfortunately, it is something that just isn't motivating a lot or persuading a lot of people in this election. Well, you mentioned one in five people want to support a candidate who uh, believes that Donald Trump won the election in 2020. And I guess this is a big question, but why do so many people think that despite the fact that court after court and you know, investigation after investigation has indicated that that's simply not the case. Um, I mean, geez, I, I, I think it's just a symptom of the really polarized time we're in and that people sort of root for their teams and are willing to either buy into delusions um, or just say, okay, I would have preferred Trump for president. And so that means I'm going to vote for people who share my preference for Trump. So I don't know, I can't analyze every, get into every one of these people's heads. And with some of these elected officials, you know, some of them I do believe are truly election deniers. But we've seen in some stories about them that behind the scenes, some of them are just like, well, you know, I'm just winking and nodding at this because I needed to get Donald Trump's endorsement. That doesn't really matter because if they're elected, you know, and they don't deliver for their base, they're going to have to deal with, um, you know, an uprising there. So either way, it's it is a it's it, a pretty ominous thing for the um, American voter because if I'm in New York, you're in New York, um, and so you might think, well, we're not going to elect an election denier here, but it will matter in 2024 when there's a presidential election. The Secretary of State in Arizona will matter to us here in New York because that person could single-handedly, you know, overturn or subvert the will of the people. And that's why we've always got to think bigger about elections. It's not just sort of what's right in front of us. And Lee Zeldin, who's running for governor here in New York, is making significant gains against Kathy Hochul, the sitting governor, uh, and he himself has, is an election denier. Right. Yeah. And he has backed off the rhetoric a bit, but he really is making significant gains. I was I was talking with some of my friends, family members. I'm, I won't out who they are. Um, people who had voted for Barack Obama, for Joe Biden, generally you know, pretty solid Democrats or, or non-voters. 
And most of them are voting straight ticket Republican this year, voting for Lee Zeldin, which is it's sort of horrifying to me because obviously I'm voting straight ticket Democrat. But it goes to show that there are people out there who are extremely pro-choice, who are um, who do believe that, you know, the stuff about the 2020 election is lunacy. But for them, and this, we're seeing this across the country, a lot, a lot of the seats that are at risk in the House are seat, congressional seats that are in blue states, states like New York, states like California, states like Oregon, states like Illinois. And why is that? It's because voters in states like this, one, you know, they're living with both a Democratic president and a Democratic governor and Democratic state legislature. So it's easy for them to blame Democrats for everything that's going wrong. But two, you know, they don't feel like New York is ever going to overturn Roe v. Um, you know, abortion rights. They don't feel like California is going to do that. So they have the luxury of voting on other issues. And, you know, in the case of the, most of the people I know in New York, top issue that they're voting on is crime. Right. And, and Republicans have made a lot of headway focusing on crime. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But yeah. I want to talk about the economy first. You know, I guess I'm going to be interviewing an, an I'm going to be interviewing an economist this week, but I've been reading some articles about whether Joe Biden is to blame for inflation and for the economy and high gas prices. A BU economist argues that inflation is caused by global right. factors. We've got the war in Ukraine. Obviously, we have the pandemic, which, as you know, affected supply chain chains uh, significantly. Um, do you think that Joe Biden is being unfairly blamed for for the economy and for inflation? Yeah, I mean, but for as long as I've been alive, as long as, you know, presidents have been blamed for high gas prices, even though there's only so much they can do about them. Presidents have been blamed for you know, economic phenomenon that are sort of out of their control. And so is he being unfairly blamed? Yes, the Republicans have really weaponized inflation and gas prices against Joe Biden, in part because they know there's really not much he can do to, to change them in the short term. Um, and they understand that this is a global phenomenon. But they understand as well that with voters, you know, voters are, are, are emotional beings and that traditionally in midterms, if they are dissatisfied, they're going to take out all the frustrations on the president. And we can scream from the rooftop saying, well, this is a global problem. But that argument just doesn't really resonate with voters because they do ultimately the buck stops with the American president. And so they are going to take it out on him. But what Democrats could do, and we've seen that more recently, is they can make the case about what the choice is in this election and what Democrats have tried to do with, you know, allowing Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices, creating jobs, um, capping the price of insulin, and with what Republicans have done, which is block all of those things, and then now say that, okay, well, if they're, if they take back the House, Senate, that they want to extend the Trump tax cuts for rich people. Social Security and Medicare on the table. And the choice element is really, really important because if we just let the Republicans go out there and say Democrats are to blame for inflation, um, you know, we're, we're going to lose that argument. Have the, the Democrats pivoted. We talked about that. Was it too little, too late? It seems like they put all, we, as we discussed on the podcast, put all their eggs in the abortion basket, so to speak. Yeah. And Realized, wait a second, people don't feel as passionately about this, which is surprising, honestly, or maybe people have short attention spans. And some people do feel continue to feel passionately about it. But did they just run lousy campaigns? And was it dumb to focus just on choice? Um, so it depends. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always loath to do like pre-mortems before the election because who knows right i you never would have found me in 2016 before the election saying donald trump is going to win the election um so i think like most people i got burned on that one but um yeah and you and i had talked about this before that um it is really really important when the economy is the number one issue for voters to be going out there and talking about the economy now some democrats have been doing a good job of that um, John Fetterman, from the beginning of his campaign, has has always made this about an economic choice. Sure, he talks about cho um, 
choice. Sure, he talks about uh, democracy, but he's done a really good job always of drawing that contrast. Tim Ryan is another one. Um, you know, Ohio is a very, very tough state, but I wish more Democrats could sort of just watch the tape of what he was saying months ago about J.D. Vance and about the Republicans. And that type of aggressive economic messaging is really, really important. But yesterday I went back and I was looking through old clips because I was like, this election cycle feels so, 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 so similar. And I realized it was the, it reminded me a lot of 2014. And you probably won't come straight to mind until I remind you of it, but same thing that year is Democrats ran focus almost all of their ads on um, contraception access, because that was the year that there was Hobby Lobby, remember, about whether um, employers could deny um, birth control coverage based on religious or personal beliefs, and that there were all these personhood bills, like on the ballot across um, the country. And then at the last minute, Democrats realized, holy heck, we've been talking way too much about this and not about the economy. And then we just saw... I think the Republicans won like nine Senate seats that year. It's nuts. I mean, then again, we also had Senate seats up in places like Louisiana, South Dakota, um, Arkansas, places where, you know, you can't even believe that we used to have Democrats. But it does feel a little bit like that. And it's like in 2012, when I worked for Barack Obama, he did talk about um, abortion and issues and gay marriage on the campaign trail. But he also made a very robust um economic argument against Mitt Romney and made it a choice election. And I always felt like in 2014, Democrats took only half of the lesson from that election and thought, just like rip their faces off on abortion. Um, but we always, 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 always got to be communicating about the economy with people. I'm talking to Liz Smith, who's, uh, can I call you an operative, a Democratic operative? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go for it. Who's giving us kind of the lay of the land. <coughs> excuse me, in the upcoming midterm elections one week from today. Let's go through some of these um, these races. And by the way, 372 candidates running have passed out on the veracity of the 2020 election. Yep. And 81% of Trump-backed candidates who won their primaries, 70% are election deniers. Yep. It's really kind of unbelievable. And I think it's a vicious cycle. I know... John Stewart interviewed someone from Arizona and he was yeah. like trying to point out that all these people think the election was rigged. And I wanted John Stewart to say they think it because people like you and others are telling them that. Right, right. And and they all, frankly, people think it because they want to believe it, you know, and, you know, the power of belief is a, is a strange thing in politics. But we're increasingly seeing this. And I think it, going back to what I said before, it has to do with sort of the uh, polarizing, you know, the polarization and how people sort of just really want to root for their team. And by the way, I mean, I was watching television tonight and saw it on social media. It is wild to me that all these people are casting doubt on the whole Paul Pelosi incident, which is horrific. Horrific. Already started to build these conspiracy theories about what happened to Paul Pelosi. It's wild. It is wild. And right. And because there have been some like um, facts or not facts, but obviously well, like false information put out by the police early on that then just gave people whatever they needed to be able to grasp onto to then run with it. And I think the reality of <laughs> and you know what, Katie, you know what I was thinking about today when, you know, you asked me to come on tonight was remember when we were talking about election deniers um, on the podcast and I think you turned to me and asked what I thought about it. And I, I was talking about, and I talked about how my biggest fear was a connection between some of these conspiracy theories and election denialism and political violence. And I wasn't thinking, okay, well, this is going to happen before the election. Right. And I said that that was my worst nightmare. And then of course you see this Paul Pelosi thing happen last week. And I mean, I don't know, it makes me, it makes me incredibly nervous for things that could happen next week. I think everyone feels that way. Yeah. Um, but, but even to hear former president Trump during an interview cast doubt on the story and saying the glass was broken from the inside, not the outside. And I was like, what, what are we, what is happening? 
I know, I know. And it's just, ugh. I, I'm not, I, I know people who have asked me those questions themselves and I quickly try to disabuse them of it, but, um, I, I, I can't, I can't, that's, that's have a psychologist on maybe or a sociologist or something like that to answer that. Cause that is above my pay grade. Yeah. And by the way, you know, Fox news and other outlets, conservative outlets have definitely pivoted to crime because they know they have a winning issue if they continue to talk about it as witnessed by some of your friends who are now voting Republican and the main motivator is crime. Um, let's talk about some of these races real quickly, Liz. All right, so is Carrie Lake gonna win in Arizona? She's running against Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, who I know has not been considered a very good candidate. She's refused to debate Carrie Lake. She. Um, you know, she just has not run a very successful campaign. And Carrie Lake is like a modern Elmer Gantry, you know? <laughs> um, she's a beast. She's a beast. Um, and, I mean, she's got a work ethic on her, and she goes out, and uh, a certain shamelessness to her that, um, unfortunately, has helped her catch fire. I think it's going to be a very close race. But if I had to guess, I would put money on it, I would say Carrie Lake would is going to win that race. Lake because, it, and you also have to look at the fact in Arizona has the highest inflation. Phoenix is the city that has, has the highest inflation any place in the country. Add to that that immigration is a top issue. And that is an issue on which Democrats have a massive, massive disadvantage with voters. And again, that's an issue where I think Democrats get unfairly blamed. But those are not issues that I would want to go into a midterm election with as top issues for voters. Okay, Masters. Okay. It, I think for Mark Kelly, this is Blake Masters. This is uh, the Arizona Senate race. Mark, is run Mark Kelly is running. Uh, his first campaign, right? Because he was, well... Special. He, he had a special election, so it's his second election. campaign. But he... So, uh, so a few things. I, I just... Um, I wrote something about this yesterday that's uh, going to be in a newspaper this weekend. But um, is I do think that we have, we have a good shot at eking it out. You know, it's going to be really, really tight. And I think that we can eke it out for a couple of reasons. Um, look, it's tough because Mark Kelly didn't really have, you know, an incumbency, right? Usually you have six years to sort of build up, build everything up. He only had two years, but he's got a really unique bio, former, you know, naval combat pilot, former astronaut, um, you know, uh, both his- Abby Giffords. Exactly. Both his parents were cops, someone who's very service oriented. And when you look at his ads, you know, they've been very much like not about national democratic stuff, not about Trump or hair on fire. It's like him talking about how he disagrees with Joe Biden on the border. Blake Masters, again, is like a card carrying member of that Island of Misfit Toys in the GOP Senate recruit class. Um, he's an odd guy who is, you know, called abortion demonic raised 9-11 truther theories and has a lot of sort of out there positions. Um, but that is a race that we'll, should be watching closely. And if we win that race, it, you know, it, it, it will largely have come down to candidate quality. All right. Let's talk about J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. Of course, J.D. Vance, uh, highly, highly critical of Donald Trump. I interviewed him several times in 2016. He did an about face and became a Trumper, got Donald Trump's endorsement. And Tim Ryan it, it really did a good job against him in the debate, I think, uh, which helped Tim Ryan. It, that is considered pretty neck and neck too. How do you see things shaping up there? So um, a couple hours ago, I watched their joint like Fox News town hall. And Tim is really good because he's a Democrat that you can put in a Fox News town hall. And because in part, he talks like a normal person. He doesn't talk like he's like some partisan robot. Um, and he did a very good job. But the just reality is in a midterm, in a state that Donald Trump won by nine points, it would take a miracle for Tim Ryan to win that race. He is so much better of a candidate than J.D. Vance is. And he is one of the best Democratic candidates running this cycle. And he's really, really done a good job of, he's got to every county in the state, 
bluish areas, reddish areas. He's, he goes on right-wing radio. He goes on Fox News. He understands that for Democrats to win in states like that, that you've got to reach out to everyone in a language that is not polarizing. But I just think it, it's a bridge too far for Democrats this year. And I'm good friends with Tim, so it brings me no joy to say that. All right, let's talk about Dr. Oz and John Fetterman. Mehmet Oz, of course, it was a very tough debate for John Fetterman uh, against someone who is very used to being on television and uh, is, is very smooth and was able to, I think, you know, really maneuver the debating, the debating format. Um, has the debate hurt John Fetterman? And tell me what you're seeing in Pennsylvania. So I talked to <laughs> I spent a lot of time talking about that race, talking with people on the ground there, because, you know, that could be the race that decides the control of the Senate. And look, I, I do think he, he took a hit in that debate. Um, and it was, it was tough TV. And I say this as someone who I, I have the utmost, you know, empathy for him. My father had a stroke and I remember watching his recovery and, the recovery takes a while when you have a stroke, but it doesn't mean that you're forever going to be in that state. Um, and the polling right now shows it as a toss up. Um, a new poll today came out showing it at, I think, 47, 47. And in the last poll before that, uh, Fetterman had been up five points. The one, a couple things that are working in Fetterman's favor are like he's still um, more people view him favorably than unfavorably. And I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a typo. I, I saw Oz's numbers in the poll. He has only 31% favorability rating and it's like 59% unfavorable or something like that. And I have just really never seen anyone get elected to office like that with those types of numbers. And that makes me think that, okay, if there are undecideds in this race, and he has seen that unfavorably, it's hard to imagine that they're gonna break his direction. And in that race, you also have, um, while Fe Fetterman's neck and neck with Oz, you have Josh Shapiro running for governor at the top of the ticket. He's up by 14 points. Um, and so um, there will be a lot of uh, Shapiro, Oz voters. Right, but, I there are a lot of tickets happening in Pennsylvania with with Josh Shapiro and Mehmet Oz, um, you know, being kind of splitting the ticket. Yeah, well, and you know, Dr. Oz is, he was always, I mean, when we call people snake oil salesmen in, in politics, um, it's a common phrase, but he, this guy was literally a snake oil salesman before he um, started running for office. And he was, he was good in the debate, but he does come across as a little smarmy, as a little too slick sometimes. And it's a contrast that sort of works to Fetterman's advantage, you know, stroke aside, communications issues aside, is that Fetterman had built up a really, really strong brand um, going into this election. And he's someone who, I was saying about Tim Ryan, right? He's someone who made a point of going to every county across the state, not just the bluest areas. And he does overperform in sort of rural counties, Rust Belt counties, uh, relative to what a Democrat usually does. And he, like Tim Ryan, has that sort of thing where he's like the walking, talking rebuttal to every cultural stereotype of Democrats, right? Of us as like coastal elites. Those guys both like do ads and like hoodies with stains on them, talk in normal piece, people language and definitely seem like guys who are much more comfortable on a factory floor than in like a room of billionaire donors. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious why you think abortion and guns have sort of lost steam as far as motivating issues for voters in general. I think when it talked about all registered voters, I think it wasn't in the, neither was in the top five <sighs> of cared about. Um, what happened? So, okay, so 
and I sort of alluded to this before, but so in a state like New York, you're not going to vote on those issues because we already have the toughest gun laws in the country. We already have some of the most liberal abortion laws. You know, same in California. So that's just not going to be a motivating thing for you to turn out because, again, you, you, it just doesn't seem plausible that governor whatever is, is going to go after this. Um, as for why they sort of flamed out in other places, it's because... It's, it's just not in front of people's faces like, um, you know, the, the bill they get, you know, the bill they see when they fill up their gas tank or how much they see their groceries costing at the grocery store. Um, those things are very, very much in their face, as is, you know, you know, anyone watching the stock market, watching what's happening with their 401ks. Those are existential things for, for a lot of people that are much more in their face than a school shooting that happened six months ago or than a Supreme Court decision that happened, uh, that came down four months ago. And, you know, to me, these are pretty existential things, but um, it doesn't mean it, they are for all voters. The one exception I would say on this and that Democrats maybe should learn from for the future is you remember in um, I think it was like 2004 2002 2004 when Republicans would put uh, gay marriage ballot initiatives on right to sort of drive up GOP turnout they did that famously in Ohio in 2004 and that was sort of credited with helping care um, Bush defeat Kerry the one the places where we're seeing abortion stay as one of the top issues are the places where it is literally on the ballot. So in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer is one of the Democrats running statewide who's really bucking the national trend. The poll that came out yesterday showed her up nine points. And that's in large part because Michigan voters, you know, have Proposition 3 to vote on, which is um, a, a, a ballot initiative that would overturn a 1931 law that would ban abortion in all cases. So abortion's top of mind for them because it's on the ballot. And so whether they're voting for someone on the sta state legislature, governor, AG, whatever, it's there. And we saw that a similar effect in Kansas where they had that initiative over the summer, but it's still carrying over. And one of the reasons why Kansas Democrats are overperforming relative to Democrats elsewhere, and we're talking about Kansas, is because abortion is sort of top of mind for them. Well, you know, what, what about Lindsey Graham's proposed national uh, abortion ban, making all abortions illegal after 15 weeks? Um, is that something that could happen if the Republicans control both houses of Congress? Um, well, it doesn't seem like among leadership, whether it's Senate leadership or House leadership, that there's a, t a huge appetite for it. Keep in mind, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that Republicans keep um, all their promises or keep their word on things, but for five decades, Republicans said that this should be a state issue. And um, I, so I, I wouldn't put it past them to try to pursue this federal legislation, legislation. But if I were the Republican Party, I would much rather be going out there and using whatever political capital they have in Washington to, uh, you know, I don't know, give tax breaks or whatever it is that they want to do, um, than continuing to argue about abortion because it is one of the few issues on which voters do give a pretty healthy edge to Democrats. We're going to wrap things up, but I wanted to ask you if, in fact, and again, somebody actually, I want to try this thing because someone asked this question, why is the media predicting a red wave when all the polls are so close? I've never done this before where I kind of had the question pop up, you know, um, yeah, it's so close. And do you think it's premature to kind of necessarily be saying this when who knows? And I know you don't like to ask about yeah. early voting, but early voting has been pretty significant. So what do you think? Um, I, and no, I know early voting has been good. It's just, I mean, Katie, I've been burned so many times over the years by early voting and early um, making predictions based on early voting. And increasingly what we see is, you know, add to the list of the ways that there are two Americas, 
One of the ways that there are two Americas is in the way Democrats vote and the way Republicans vote. Um, and yes, there are still Democrats who, who largely turn out on election day, older voters, black voters, for instance. Republicans are, are much more election day voters. And so when I see these high early vote numbers that are very good for Democrats, you know what those suggest to me? That there's just going to be monster, monster turnout in 2020. 22, and that um, the, the election day turnout is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. Now, to the question about the media. So I haven't really seen them saying it's gonna, going to be a red wave. Um, but what I've seen them saying is that it's going to look more predictable, like more like a predictable midterm. And, you know, history just tells us that traditionally the incumbent, the party that controls the White House loses, I think, what is it? Uh, 23, 28 seats in the House, they lose an average of four Senate seats, um, all of that. And um, so it looks like if you look at the House race polls, I, it looks sort of in line with what the average is. The Senate could be different, but Senate races in in 2018, 2020 sort of defied history too. Because you remember we picked up um, over, I think over 40 se- Democrats picked up over 40 seats in 2018. Yet somehow we lost two Senate seats. So it's a little harder these days to predict um, uh, the Senate terrain, and it just sort of depends on the year. But um, anything's possible. It's clear that both sides are pretty engaged. And um, so the you know, enthusiasm level for Republicans is higher, according to polls. But then, of course, polls may be wrong. So We could be, you know, anything can happen. But along the lines of if, in fact, uh, the Republicans take over both the House and the Senate, what will that mean? I heard Ted Cruz talking about uh, impeaching Merrick Garland, uh, talking about impeaching the head of HHS. Uh, People have talked about impeaching Joe Biden. I mean, what? Right, exactly. And it would be... Again, I'm not in the business of giving political advice to Republicans, um, but it would be pretty stupid if they get control and they go down these rabbit holes of, you know, just doing endless investigations of Hunter Biden, endless investigations of administration officials trying to impeach Joe Biden. But like, you have to understand, they're also going to have Donald Trump on the outside putting enormous pressure on them every day, tweeting or whatever, whatever he calls it, true thing on his, on his site, uh, saying that uh, they need to be investigating these officials. They need to be impeaching Joe Biden. And today's modern, you know, today's Republican Party seems to take their cues from Donald Trump. Um, so, yeah, that's not good, but it could mean two years of chaos that then could benefit Democrats. I would prefer not to see those two years of chaos. Uh, had enough. I, I, I know. I want, like, just make, I, you know what my favorite slogan would be for um, political candidates going forward is, like, make politics boring again. And I'm someone who works in politics. I just really would love it for it to be boring. But the other Perhaps things that make America sane again. Well, right. I, I look. I'm just. I, I'm. I'm going for the, like the the lowest bar here. But the other thing that Republicans have talked about is, and it would be a political disaster for them, is um, repealing, for instance, the some of the drug price provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that would allow Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices. And on what planet do they think that would be good for them with voters? But th- they talk about that. They talk about wanted to um, make the Trump tax cuts permanent. Again, that's something that's not going to be popular with the majority of voters. So um, there's probably a reason why Republicans have been trying to make this race entirely a a referendum on Joe Biden, because they know that if voters need their true agenda, that they probably, it wouldn't be a good thing for them. Hey, because I have this nifty little trick, I'm doing this. Does Be- does Beto have a chance in Texas? These um, questions from our viewers. I think he's like, look, I I, I like Beto. Um, I've talked to him a few times over the years. I think he's run an exciting campaign. But going back to what I said about Ohio, um, is yep. this- the fundamentals are tough. 
Say again? No, it's, it's, it's going to be, a, it would take a miracle. It would take a miracle. And it brings me no joy to say that. All right. On that, on that note, Liz, thank you so much for doing this. I, I'm super interested in what's going on in the midterms. And thank you for giving us some clarity. And it's always fun to talk to you. And I like that your cat is kind of roaming around in the background. At first, I thought it was a rat. Oh my God. Well, why didn't you tell me? Well, then I noticed very quickly, I saw, oh no, that's her cat. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, I am a crazy cat lady. I've actually got two, but for some reason, whenever I'm doing something on Zoom, they decide that's when they got to come alive. So anyway, thanks so much, Liz. Right. And thanks everybody. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye.